we really feel we're onto something here. People can knock us all they want, but um, we'll prove everybody wrong. I've got great staff here. And most of all, the players. I think we've got real quality lads here. Great spirit. It's, um, they deserve the success, and I think that they'll get it. Come here, sir. We shouldn't be at the bottom of the league, but the facts are we are at the bottom of the league. But we feel and we believe here that that will change very shortly. If we don't believe it, then, of course, you know, nobody else is going to. John Gorman is a name new to management. He's taken over at Swindon, where Premiership survival is the prime concern. John's appointment came after a long involvement in football that began as a schoolboy with Celtic. Later, he was in the Carlisle side, which against the odds, topped the first division for one weekend in 1974. An able and ambitious player, he then moved on to Tottenham. Injury effectively ended his playing days in England, but in Tampa, he was an all-star in the North American Soccer League. On the coaching side, he started at the bottom, working with youngsters at Gillingham and Leighton Orient. Before that past association with Spurs led to the link-up with Glenn Hoddle. He played a major part as promotion came through the playoffs, but now the total responsibility for Swindon and their style is his. You watched the foreign teams play. I mean, I'm not going to ever talk bad about English game because I think it's the best. This is the best football. But if we can add the, the techniques to, to winning matches, surely that's what it's about. We would love to see goals scored like we scored at um, Wembley when we got to, to that. That was a romantic game. That was true romance, and to win like we did at Wembley. That was um, great, great football. Winning uh, is, is important, but to win playing foot, good football surely is, is the goal for everybody, every manager and every coach. John Gorman, the manager of Swindon, the boss. John, management is a very daunting experience, but you took over from Glen Hoddle at a time when Swindon were going into the top league for the first time in their history and you were a manager for the first time in your life. It seems pretty daunting from the outside. What's it like from the inside? Um, it's not too bad as, as people, you know, probably think it is. It's been okay, man. It's been harder only for one reason, is that we're at the bottom of the league. But I've really enjoyed it. I mean, I've enjoyed, um, obviously, I enjoyed last year as well, getting up to the Premier League. That was um, a great achievement. Um, everything happened that quickly, as you say. Glenn was leaving, I was almost going with him. Um, and, you know, it all happened so, so quickly. And, you know, at the minute, things could be better, but um, we're very hopeful that things are going to change very shortly. You've won perhaps more friends than points because of the way the team is playing. Are you going to be able to sustain that, this romantic yeah. style of football? It's not romantic. It's the way football should be played. Um, and, and as I said, we'll continue to play it. Just recently, we just come away from White Hart Lane Saturday, and I think at last people are starting to realise that um, Swindon aren't as bad as people are making out. Um, we shouldn't be at the bottom of the league, but the facts are we are at the bottom of the league. But we feel and we believe here that that will change very shortly. If we don't believe it, then of course you know nobody else is going to. But football, I mean, I don't know what these people mean by romantic. I mean, we pass the ball to feet if we can. We play long balls. We you know we we, we make chances. We cross balls. So, no, I don't think we're playing romantic football at all. Well, I make a comparison perhaps with what's happening at Southampton, where the supporters have turned against Ian Branford, even mm. all the uh, hard work that he's put in. And one of their complaints is perhaps that they're not playing the sort of football that the fans want. You're not under any obvious pressure here. No, because of the style of football that the fans do want to see and they've been used to. Um, obviously, um, Louis played a, a little bit different style, but they've got great success with it here, Swindon. And Louis done, done magnificent. Louis McCarry, this as, as a manager. Aussie came and he changed the style completely to you know the, the, you know the Aussie way of playing, and and um, everybody took to it. Glenn and I came in and we continued it and put in a little bit version of our own. And Glenn's left now, and hopefully I will keep it going as long as I'm here. You mentioned Lou Macari, and that takes us right back perhaps to the beginning of your life in football uh, 30 years ago. Lou Macari, yeah. Kenny Dalglish, Davy Hay, who's your Davey assistant, assistant here now. Yeah. Um, what are your memories of that time as a, as a Celtic youngster? Great. Um, with a team that really were, you know, outstanding. Um, Davy and I, you know, often, that, that is romance, we talk about it and go back to it. Jokestein was the manager then, and everybody knows about Jokestein. 
there, there's a lot of fear from, from the players from him, but not fear in, on the football field, only fear and the respect that we had from him as the man he was, he had a big, great awe about him. And um, you, you, you wouldn't do anything out of place, you, you wouldn't have your hair out of place. If he came by, you'd be frightened your hair was not right, because he, he would pick up on it. But um, when he came on the football field, he allowed you to express yourself. And that was a great thing I left from I left from Celtic. I went to Carlisle, and to be honest, I, I probably enjoyed my football at Carlisle more than any other club that I'd been with. Why was that? Again, because of the football that I was encouraged, and I probably had my best spell um, as, a, as a player. I was at the prime, probably. I was 20 when I left Celtic. Um, disappointing I left Celtic because I thought I was um, going to make it the first team, but there was that many players. Tommy Gemmell was in the team at the time, and my future, it, I didn't look like I was going to break through. Went to Carlisle and um, had six good years there, especially the first three years, where um, you know the football we played was really, it was like the old Tottenham style at that time, the old push and run. And my coach at that time um, had many managers, and they were all good. I had um, Bob Stoker, who signed me, who was excellent. E. McFarlane, um, there was um, Alan Ashman, who took us up to the first division. Um, and the last, of, but what I thought was the best, was um, Dick Young. And I don't think they'll, be they'll, they'll feel that I'm being disrespectful to them. He wasn't the best as a manager because he probably got it too late. He, he was given the job probably, um, so he was a bit too old, really, to get it in the end. Um, but his coaching ability and what I learned from Dick, um, I've kept right through my whole career as a player and now as a, ma a coach and manager. During your time at Carlisle, it was that amazing weekend when Carlisle United were actually top of the entire league. And people with your connection are comparing the Carlisle of then with the Swindon of today. That really must have been an amazing time, though, when you were looking down on all the other clubs. <laughs> yeah, I remember it well. It was, it was a good feeling, but um, we knew that it wouldn't last. You know, we were happy to be there and like to have continued it. I think Swindon are in their better shape, um, you know, as a club than what Carlisle was then as well. Um, I really do. But at the same time, never forget that memory either because it was, it was excellent. But I don't like to be compared with Swindon because I think it's unfair. At the minute, we were bottom and Carlisle were top, but Carlisle finished bottom and I don't aim to finish bottom with Swindon. How did the move to Spurs come about? Well, that was another um, a long story, really. Um, well, what happened was I've been three very happy and successful years, but like all players, I was very ambitious, and I wanted to play in the Premier League, which was the first division, of course, then. And um, we'd been relegated, and I was desperate to get away, and the players will probably give me a stick, but, you know, I went, I went to the tribunal, which then was a bit different from now. You know, it wasn't freedom of contract or nothing. You had to fight for your case, and... Um, Consequently, I went to Manchester because I felt I knew and known the club had actually told me that there had been teams wanting to buy me, and um, <clears throat> I felt they wanted too much money then, which was over a hundred thousand pounds, which was quite a lot of money, you know. And um, I just felt if, if the price was 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 hundred thousand or less, that I would get away. And consequently, I went to the tribunal, didn't sign a contract for about two seasons, and I just played out and just played on, you know. And um, I got my move to, to Tottenham. I went to the tribunal. I thought, oh, it's never going to happen, but it only took about three months and um, Spurs came in with a bid for me. I think it was 80,000 and um, I was lucky enough to get to a great club like Tottenham. You sound as though you were a pretty hard player to manage. <laughs> yeah, I probably was, actually. <laughs> I was like um, quite a few of the boys who got here. I mean, no, I wasn't really. I, I just got on my job. But I, I really was um, ambitious. I think every player should be. I was very ambitious to, to, to play at as high a level as I could. And um, that's why, I mean, like players like Colin Caldwell, when it come this season, when, when you knew how much, I mean, he, he loved this club, but he didn't want to leave. He'd been like myself at Carlisle, but he, he, he felt that um, the chance might pass him by. And um, he, sometimes you can't stand in people's way. And, and that was a, the, the, the same circumstances as, as me. Unfortunately, what could have been a dream move for you to Tottenham was ruined by a serious knee injury. You moved from England to the United States, which a lot of players did around that time. Gordon Jago took you to Tampa Bay Rowdies. How did you find the standard compared to England in the United States? It was good, man. Mm -hmm. It was much better than people gave it credit for. Mm -hmm. I remember people went over and said, Mickey Mouse football. I mean, I, I, I dare let me say that now, because how could it... There was Beckenbauer, there was Cruyff, there was Naiskins, there was Best, there was, there was Gret Muller, there was Rodney Marsh. I mean, I just... Alan Hudson, there was... And this is just to name a few. There was just players after... Every team had at least four or five world-class internationals. And they weren't like they were, they were finished. Some of them were still 29, 31, you know, whatever. It's not as if they're finished. In fact, some of them like, even went back and played for the country, even in Germany and Holland after that. It's quite a media circus as well, wasn't it, around the yeah. league? 
Did you learn things then that have stood you in good stead now in your present job? Yeah, I think I have. Um, again, all the all the different. It was nice to play against players from different parts of the world. You know, to appreciate the skills. I played with Brazilian players like Oscar, you know, Oscar Fabiani's and people like that, and they were, they were um, excellent techniques. You know, and, and you learn things from them in training and everything. And you remember little things that they did and, and, and what you did in practice, and you, and you put it all into your practices. Did it frustrate you? You were what they call an all-star player there. I think every year that you played in America that you hadn't actually been able to um, maybe show off your entire best in a big club uh, in Britain. Yeah, I think, I, I think you're spot on there. I think always, uh, especially leaving Celtic um, so early. I mean, I know if I'd have probably stayed yeah. at Celtic, you know, who knows, but I, I would like to have thought that I could have won and got international caps as well, because Danny and me played the same time together, and Danny was a right back. Danny McGrain. Yeah, Danny McGrain, sorry. Yeah. And, and um, when I left, Danny, Danny played in most of his international career at left back. In fact, Danny was very, um, you know, m very much a right back, but he had a great career even at left back. So, you know, there's always that little bit of well, only I'd stayed on a little bit longer. Tottenham the same, um, because of the injury, I had to move off to America. And of course, once you went to America, people thought your career was finished, that you never actually played again. I've often had people say, "Oh, you finished your career early." I said, "No, I didn't. I was still playing at 38." You know, so because after I played outdoor over there, I went on and played indoor with Phoenix, and, and I came back. When I came back to Gillingham, I still managed to play in the reserves and even managed the first team out in, at um, 37 and a half. You know. Why did you come back? Because it was a wonderful lifestyle in America. Yeah. It must have been very tempting, a family man, to, to, to bring up your children out there and, and enjoy all the comforts of the United States. Yeah, my family, I mean, to be honest, they've been dragged everywhere. A, you know, they've been great. I mean, still, <laughs> to stick it. And, um, you know, t America was a great way of life with a lovely home. Um, in fact, I'd a home in Phoenix and a home in um, Florida. Not that it was well off, it's just that it was much easier to buy over there than it was to rent. Um, but football always has this thing, I mean, if you're not in the game as a, as a pro, as soon as I stopped um, playing at Phoenix, the team folded in Phoenix, so I was basically out, out, of, out of work. Um, I, did, I came back to Tampa, I was going to start, I did start my own soccer camps, coaching, and that was going very well. But there was just this call for to come back to, to be involved in pro football and, and give something back to the game. Um, and to be honest, Keith Peacock, um, who worked with me as um, assistant manager at Tampa Bay, he always said one day, because he knew, because I used to like working with the young ones, the young American players, that is, and he says, I'll have you coaching with me one day. And he was true to his word, and he brought me back um, to Gillingham. It wasn't for, a big, as Keith would probably tell you, it wasn't for a lot of money. It was, um, but um, I'm glad I've done it this way. I've done it the hard way, and I've, en I've enjoyed my step up through the youth, through the reserves, being assistant manager with Paul Taylor at Gillingham. Learned a lot from Paul as well, learned a lot from Keith, learned a lot from Gordon Jago, from, I said, every manager, just keep it all, you know, what you've, all the good things and all the bad, and, you know, keep the good and, and throw the bad out. And it was a very long playing career, but the way you've described it, sounds to me as though uh, it's been a mission, really, to get into the position that you finally found yourself in, in June, when Glenn Hoddle said he was going to Chelsea. Was it really because you wanted to be a manager in your own right that you decided that you would stay here and not go with Glenn? Yeah, I think that was, um, it was very difficult because Glenn and I are, were very, very close and still are, you know, um, to go with Glenn because, I mean, we, we really did get on very well together and felt the same about football. But um, I've always wanted to be my boss anyway. And before I went to, um, to Swindon. I'd been trying to get my own job, you know, obviously, I think, and again, I'd have to start at the lower regions, and um, I was hopeful to, to get the Carlisle job in my old club. I'd like to have tried, because it, I, being a bit romantic, as you said earlier, I'd like to have went back um, to Carlisle, and um, probably with the help of Les O'Neill, to try and get them back to where I believe they should be. But um, Glenn just gave me a call one day and said, look, you're coming with me to Swindon, forget the Carlisle job, because he knew that I was trying to get a job and, um, as my own boss. And um, consequently, that's where I've ended up with Glenn. Um, but deep in my heart, I, I've always wanted to, to be, be your own general, but circumstances um, aren't like they are now. It's not the easiest of jobs I've, I've taken on. Um, but in saying that, I'm, I'm really pleased I have because I'm so lucky that I've been left with, um, you know, players that respected, um, hopefully respected myself. And um, we continued the same style and the same continuity as we had before which I think was very important. Um, you know, it could have been easily been a different figure come in and changed it all around completely. 
might have got more success at this present time, but I think in the long run, the way we are playing and doing now will be better and more successful for this club. Many people would say that you're in a no-win situation, that in fact Swindon are not equipped to compete in the Premiership. I think we are. I think there's no questions that we are. I think that um, we've spent a bit of money. I mean, that's another thing. The board has said, go out and, you know, I've spent more money than any other manager, basically because I've had to. Um, we lost Glenn um, as a player. We lost Colin Calderwood, who was a captain and an excellent player. We'd, we had lost David Curley just beforehand. Um, we lost David Mitchell through no fault of our own. It was a close in his contract, and he's ended up coming back, which is, you know, he was one of our players. Um, he went to Turkey. Yeah. yeah. You know, so we've had to we've had to replace these players, and um, I think we've done we've done well and we've done very well in the replacements. The sky cameras were here for the game against Liverpool early in the season, and I got the impression then talking to some of your supporters that deep deep down maybe they don't really yeah, expect you, came you to down, survive. I think yeah, you might, when that game now if we had that game again, I think you'd see a different game. I think that we were learning; it was quick. Um, I think that. I think you're wrong. I think that our supporters do expect us to survive, and I think um, by each week we'll grow more in confidence. Uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. It's early days. Nobody's going to, um, you know, nobody can tell what's going to happen really at the end of the season. That, that everybody can guess, but if we don't believe in it, and we do believe in it, so um, we think we're going to be okay. You have been a manager now for what, less than six months, but has it made any great impact on your personality? What are you like on the bench, for example? Yeah, well, I can become a bit emotional, to be honest, um, get a bit excited. But I think I'm, I'm even calming down in that respect. Um, I had a bit of advice after the Man United game from Alec Ferguson through David, actually. He said, tell John not to shout so much, and, you know, he gets a bit... Which was great advice, because he's, Alex has obviously been through it all, and he probably was like me at the beginning, screaming and shouting for everything, you know, and, and almost kicking every ball. Um, I possibly regret um, my reactions. It was shown probably on, on Sky and on BBC as well when, when, when I went on, on the floor against um, Oldham. Um, I, I wish I hadn't done it, but it was a, again, that was me. Because if, if it had been a goal for us, I'd have been jumping over the, the wall, you know? Because um, I just do things off the cuff and um, sometimes it looks a bit silly and you regret it, re you sometimes regret it afterwards. And, um, but I think football should be a natural game emotions should be allowed to come out and normally comes out um, either when a goal's been scored or, um, or a chance has been missed or a goal's been scored against you. Football has been your life now for almost 30 years, but how do you switch off from it? Not as much as I'd like now. Um, in fact, Myra, my wife, was just saying that um, the, to Dave and me last night. We were over watching the match again, the match on TV, Southampton game, um, and we are just saying I used to do a lot of artwork as you probably know, uh, I've just never had the time since I've been coaching really even. Like Glenn used to say to me, why don't you get drawn again? I said, well, when, when are you going to give me a minute? You know, because in football, you know, there's so much else to do in the, the, um, off the field, you know, and scouting and different things. And really, my concentration is not there. I need time, but I enjoy art. I enjoy um, doing a bit of paint, and, you know, and it's fun, but it takes time. Were you ever trained in it? No, never. My brother was a great artist, actually. Brother's dead now, but he was he was fabulous drawer. Um, he was a natural. Um, he was a different style for me though. He was more of a sign writer and you know stuff like that. I'm more. I like to do portraits and things. You know, I like to draw caricatures and have a bit of fun. I, um, I don't really like doing landscapes and things like that. Do you think you could have ever earned a living in it? Was there any yeah. time over these 30 years when football looks like it might be turning its back on you that you were looking in that direction? Um, no, I never felt it was ever going to be because football's my first and first love, apart from obviously my family. But um, football's the, the, the main thing. Art's just a secondary thing, just something for. But um, there was a spell where, where, where I was out injured at Tottenham, funny enough, and um, I'd done some car caricatures of all the players. They made a calendar. I made some money, you know. I made a few, but I better not tell it. <laughs> but um, it was, that was good. And, and I did the same in America because the Americans love all that, you know. And when I was playing, I had more time when you're playing, and, and you know, I had some spare time in the afternoons, and I used to sit down and draw a lot. And um, I, I, I did quite well in America. I had, I had a, another few calendars and posters made, and, and that, that went quite well. It went down well with the fans. Yeah. It keeps coming back to this word romantic, because uh, surely somebody of an artistic temperament would want to play <laughs> the way 
uh, you play yeah. your football. So there must, there must be something in that. You must be a bit of an idealist, really. Yeah, I think so. But, I mean, I just feel I'm a realist as well. I don't think, I mean, you watch the foreign teams play. And that's the way, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to ever talk bad about English King because I think it's a, the best, this is the best football. But if we can add the, the techniques to, to winning matches, surely that's what it's about. I mean, I'd like to win every game like we played Saturday at Tottenham, you know, lovely football. But we, we ended up getting a penalty for a goal. You know, some of our moves, uh, one move in the first half, ended up with Luke and I holding in a great position, back heeling the ball for Paul Bowden. If I went in, what a goal it would have been. But it wasn't to be, it, 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 you know, Paul mishit it. Um, the goal we got was, was for, for a bundle over, you know, and you get a penalty after all the good football, because that's um, the reality of football. But we would love to see goals scored like we scored at um, Wembley when we got to that. That was a romantic game, that was true romance, and to win like we did at Wembley, that was um, great, great football. But no, we're, we're realists, but we really feel that, you know, the way we're playing football is, um, is the right way to play. But winning uh, is, is important. But to win playing foot, good football surely is, is the goal for everybody, every manager and every coach. Are you perhaps the one manager in the league who can get through this season without winning enough games because of the situation that Swindon are in? Because you're making friends with the way that you're playing? What do you mean, uh, without getting the sack, you mean? Without getting yeah. the sack, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I think I think that um, I wouldn't be entitled to the sack if we um, if we if we don't stay up. But whether well, they see it that way, um, I, I really believe that we will stay up, and they believe in, in what we're doing. As I said as well, if we were playing poorly and being where we are now, then I think I'd be I'd be given the sack. I think I'd have been out, out the door and deservedly so. But because we're playing well, and we are we are playing well, and we'll get better. The thing is now, once we get that first win under a belt, and it will come, there's no doubt about it. If it doesn't come, then obviously then it's got to be looked at in a different light. But um, you've got to be positive, Martin. If you're, if you're not positive, then nothing's going to change for you. And we're positive that things will change here. Everybody who loves football wishes you every success, John. Thanks again. Thank you, Martin. Thanks very much. The Boss was proudly sponsored by Ford.